Welcome to season two, episode 11 of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. My name is Dr. Kirk Megu, and I'm the Public Relations Officer of the United National Congress, the official opposition party in the Republic of Trinidad and Tobago. This is a unique venture, streaming simultaneously from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, Dehradun in India, and San Francisco in the United States. We speak with people from around the world, trying to understand different issues and problems relevant to my own country, Trinidad and Tobago, but also to people in sometimes very similar or sometimes very different situations, cultures, histories, politics, sociology, etc. The goal is to learn from each other, to build networks, to widen our perspectives, and to work for solutions in our distinctive contexts. Today's episode is titled Trinidad Steel Pan in the Global Culture Industry, Navigating Possibilities and Conflicts. The steel pan has a crucial place in the culture and history of Trinidad that the outside world may find difficult to understand. In the rest of the world, there's an image of cruise ships, hotels, happy-go-lucky islanders in Hawaiian shirts and straw hats, you know, tied to novelty songs in the tourist industry. But in truth, the steel pan was created by warring street gangs in the slums of Port of Spain, the capital of Trinidad and Tobago. To this day, the names of the bands are desperados, renegades, invaders, you know, reflecting the territorial gang turf battles. I think there are parallels probably with the early breakdancing battles in New York City in the 1970s and 80s. The music played on steel pans in Trinidad too is not novelty tourist music. In fact, the island doesn't really have a properly developed tourism sector at all. There are, in, in fact, it has an oil industry where the pans are derived from. There are massive bands of over 100 persons playing on a range of pans from tenor, double tenors, bass, double guitars, cello pans, and more with a very sizable engine room of various percussion instruments and a full drum kit. Uh, these huge bands compete in island-wide competitions. They play serious music from popular local compositions to complex European symphonies and all to huge, enthusiastic and very knowledgeable audiences. It should be obvious that there has been much lost in translation, often deliberately distorted, as a steel pan has spread across the world. A Trinidadians have long dreamt of making the steel pan a serious international instrument, perhaps in a similar way that reggae was turned from a novelty music in the 1960s to a serious genre in the 1970s. There's also a whole economy which supports and is supported by the steel pan cultural complex, which has implications for indigenous and global economic development in Trinidad and Tobago. Some inroads have been made but there remain challenges. Today, I have as my guest, Dr. Mia Gormandy Benjamin from Trinidad and Tobago and Dr. Janine Tiffy from the USA to reflect on these issues and more. I hope I got uh, Dr. Tiffy's name correct, uh, right. Dr. Janine Tiffy is Assistant Professor of Ethnomusicology at the Kent State University School of Music in Ohio, where she directs the African Ensemble and Steel Band. She has performed with Women in Steel and Invaders Steel Orchestra. And as a member of Azaguno, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, she performed for the 2002 FIFA World Cup ceremonies in Seoul, Korea. Mia Gorm Gormandy Benjamin is an assistant professor of music at the University of Trinidad and Tobago and a steel pan performer and commentator. Her doctoral research focused on the history of performance practices of steel pan musicians in Japan. Dr. Gormandy Benjamin has performed in several different countries around the world, including Australia, uh, Austria, England, Japan, the United States, Canada, and countries of the Caribbean. She has also performed with many world-renowned artists, such as 11-time Grammy Award winner, Paquito de Rivera, and she is the co-founder of the Global Steel Pan Project called the Virtual Steel, Pan, Steel Band, where 22 countries with over 300 panists are registered with the organization. She later worked with the Pan in Unity Project 
as a response to the 2020 pandemic, which featured 691 musicians from 23 countries. Impressive. Welcome, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. Nice. Well, great. I, I gave a long introduction there, so the rest I will hand over to you. Um, we like to start off the program by getting a little bit of background about uh, from our guests uh, to, to their own interests uh, into the subject at hand. So for today, I'd, I'd like you to tell us and tell our audience a bit more about your background and how you got involved in the steel pan, both as a musician and as an academic. I'll start off with Janine and then Mia. Yeah, so um, basically as a child, getting into the music system in school in fifth grade, um, we got to pick an instrument we wanted to play in band. And for me, that was the drums, which is probably uh, stereotypically not what you would expect usually of a female, but obviously there are many amazing female drummers and percussion. Yeah. Um, so By that the was way, where, where did you grow up? Did you grow up in Ohio or was it elsewhere? That was in Ohio. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. So I did that fifth grade through middle school, high school, always doing the band thing. In high school, I joined marching band. Um, and then when I got to college, there were two different types of world music, if you will, mm -hmm. so-called ensembles. One was African ensemble, which occurred really just a short period every year. And then steel band, which is curricular. So it was a class you could enroll in and it was happening all the time. Um, so wow. ultimately- In Ohio, that was part, so just to clarify, so I don't, that was at the tertiary level or the secondary level? Uh, that was at the collegiate level. Collegiate, right, okay. Mm -hmm. So um, when I got there and learned about those two ensembles, I was really stoked. Uh, I always did music and I was minoring in music. I actually, my major was zoology and that was my major until I went on to graduate studies. Um, but what I noticed about both those types of music is, I mean, it was just so rhythmic and complicated and it was like nothing that I had experienced so far as a drummer or as uh -huh. a percussionist. And I really, I mean, I just loved, I, I wanted to know about that and wanted more and you know, to get into what was the most challenging thing I at least had really heard or had the opportunity um, to be a part of. So that's really where it started and then played in graduate school when I started um, studying ethnomusicology, played in a band in doctoral school. Both those bands I also directed. I've directed or played in a variety of gig bands in Ohio or New York or Florida, which is where I've lived and or gone to school. Um, played in both the bands that you mentioned in my bio. Um, I've directed some community bands in Florida. Right. And yeah, so that's kind All of- All right, very good, very good. So, so, that's, so that's interesting. So, when, and so when, you, when you took up the instrument, when it was offered to you, you you weren't necessarily familiar with the music at all but so that's interesting to so that very interesting and so mia let me hand it over to you so how did you get involved in the steel pan and you know, both as a musician and as an academic um well when i was a young child around the age of five my my parents bought a steel pan brought it in the house for my older brother um and he wasn't very interested in playing um and how much older was your brother you were five your brother he, my brother is 14 years older than i am oh, okay you know, but he's also uh, mentally challenged okay so but he loved music and my parents saw his interest in music so they thought right. he would like the pan <laughs> mm -hmm. so they bought a pan and hired a music teacher to come home you know to our house to teach him but he was not interested uh, in the pan instead I was reaching over my head trying to uh, play and lessons for him turned into lessons for me reaching over your head so it's not a toy pan it's a real it pan was a real toy. pan okay. the height right. that that you would usually put at the height of an adult right. <laughs> you know mm -hmm. and I was really trying hard to, to play and eventually they lowered the pan for me um, and I started learning and then I entered my first competition at six years old and won and my parents were like, that's insane. You know, 
Thank you. By the way, for the international viewers who may not be familiar with the steel pen, she has a real one behind her. A, oh, a yeah, real this big is the one. Right here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so at six, you know, after I won that competition, my parents thought, oh, maybe we're onto something here. And I just continued lessons and, and continued playing in lots of competitions. And at nine years old, I joined the Trinidad All Stars Steel Orchestra. So I was on their stage side, which means I performed all throughout the year in performances. Was your family um, involved in, in uh, Trinidad All-Stars? And like cousin, brothers, father? And well, they eventually you just, did. You just went in as a nine-year-old. <laughs> as a nine-year-old well, girl. Parents, <laughs> no, my parents were fans of the steel band because usually right. the steel bands are all community steel bands and everybody, you know, at, at least at that time, usually had a steel band that they would follow or they would back yeah. and support. And my parents loved the Trinidad All Stars. So right. they took me there and my father was also playing when I was there, you know, right. for Panorama. He'd come and play iron. Sometimes he played guitar mm -hmm. pan, you know. Um, and yeah, and I, I played with them for many years on their stage side for Panorama. And then at 15, I got a full scholarship to study music and steel pan performance at Northern Illinois University. And so I, at 16 years old, I left Trinidad. Oh, that's interesting. So how did you get that um, scholarship? Well, I actually went to a performance in Trinidad um, that where Liam Teague and Dr. Larry Snyder happened to be attending. It was an award ceremony. Uh, right. And uh, I was just performing there like I normally do. And I think they were, they were impressed. And uh, at that point, you know, Liam said, I'm going to try and get your scholarship to come to NIU. And right. Dr. Uh, Larry Snyder. He was Snyder, teaching there? Yes. Teaching he, at the time? Yes, right. yes, he was. And Dr. Larry Snyder was also at um, University of Akron. And uh, that also awarded me the opportunity to be their guest artist at their next steel band concert. Nice. So, uh, you know, that, that same year, actually the April following that performance, I was a guest artist at NIU, Northern Illinois University, and a guest artist at University of Akron. And then that, that summer in August, I moved to Illinois to start my bachelor's degree and that's kind of where my um, that's where I started tertiary level education mm. and when I was finishing up my master's there uh, I had a research class that I needed to do and I wanted my research to be on the judging of panorama and I wanted right. to know how that has developed over the years and did did you have any personal grievances with judging when you were with All Stars or something? <laughs> um, not necessarily. I think I was just intrigued with yeah. how they judge the competition, you know, especially when you have all these really big names, you know, arranging such fantastic work. And then you get to the judges and you're like, oh, you know, the judges are also <laughs> talented in their own right. But it's like, how do you, how were you able to do that? You know, and I was just, I just didn't know enough and I wanted yeah. to know more. And lo and behold, of course, while all my classmates had tons and tons of books to, to choose from for their topic, I didn't have any books to choose from. You know, I took one book from the library that had a paragraph that mentioned a pan. You know, so I spoke to my um, lecturer at the time and she said, why don't you become an ethnomusicologist? You know, maybe you could change that and, and write for pan and, you know, do academic research. And I said, what's that? <laughs> you know, and, and that's kind of how I started my journey as an ethnomusicologist. And then while well, I was at Florida State, and that's where I met Janine. Yeah, okay. And I, we both did our, our um, doctorates there at, at Florida State University in ethnomusicology. So, um, yeah, that's kind of my story. <laughs> oh, very interesting, very interesting one. Thanks for that. So let me ask both of you then. Uh, it's interesting coming from your different perspectives. Um, now, what, what are your insights into the way that the steel pan is viewed around the world? You know, from both your personal insights, I guess, from yourself, um, either growing up, Janine, or Mia, when you went abroad and you maybe heard what people were saying or thinking, and then also, I guess, from your, your research. So, Janine, first. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I mean, mostly I can speak about the U.S. Um, I think for the most part here, as far as mainstream. So, you know, you, you asked if um, I really knew about the pan before I started playing in college. I didn't, but I'm sure I had some kind of exposure in yep. some type of kids show. I love Lucy or something. <laughs> Mr. Rogers, yeah, I mean, it's, it's there, but like I wasn't really cognizant of it. And so, I mean, as far as mainstream culture, you know, it exists there and I think most of the time 
within that framework, it's very, like you said in the introduction, it's sort of this uh, amalgamation of vacation, beach, uh, beverage, like a pina colada and right. the shirts and the hats and it being laid back. And I think, you know, in general, that's how it's viewed and used by the media here. I mean, there have mm -hmm. always been some there's always an interesting commercial or two that crops up from time to time that has yeah. pan in the background that's Correct. very much just a signifier of the tropics or right. the water or something like that regardless. So, I mean, I think that is a, a real lion's share of how in the mainstream mm -hmm. the pan is viewed. I think also, um, I mean, there are people, of course, and even ways it's used in the media to signify more so as like a urban or youth or that type of activity. So there are some really well-known rap songs that have had just pan samples in it, like 50 Cent's P-I-M-P. Yeah, so like a Trini when they hear, oh, that's a pan. But <laughs> no people, no other people might notice it. But we just inside us as uh, maybe how that happened. Um, I mean, I think it's probably, again, a variety of ways. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think in a pragmatic sense, the instrument is relatively accessible, right? Um, we can make sheet music for it, which is commonly used in schools here. So we can get through literature fairly easily. It's an instrument that, I mean, it takes a long time to master obviously, but you can touch it, you can hit it and it's going to make some type of reasonable sound, hopefully. Right. So it's very accessible in that fashion. Um, I mean, there are people who, I mean, it, it got here because of immigration. There are people yeah, yeah. who brought it here because they went on a cruise ship or something and they learned about it and they wanted it for their percussion studio or something like that. So it really kind yeah. of runs the gamut of how, you know, it yeah, got here in a different maybe, place. Maybe Mia might also have some insights into that. But you know, you, you mentioned about the universality and that brought to mind some research done by Dr. Kim Johnson I don't think it's his insight. It's from an interview he must have done with the panist. But, uh, but he, he talked about how the pan is arranged in a circle of fourths. Well, it depends on which way you go, circle of fifth or circle of fourth. And um, uh, which is a, uh, for music theory people, that's incredible because nothing is arranged like that. But for, but for some, you know, so it's, it's, it's like the arrangement of the notes on the pan too is. Um, you know, it's, it's highly, highly uh, sophisticated in terms of that. So I, I don't know, may, maybe there's some kind of connection there. But yeah, so Mia, let me invite you. Um, your insights into the way steel pan is viewed around the world, both from your own experience, especially when you went abroad. And then, you know, you've done a lot of research about Japan and you've, you've gone to all these countries. So I'd like to hear your view. Yeah, um, I think it depends on where you go uh, yeah. around the world. You know, you'd see different um, reactions to the instrument. You'd also see people understanding the instrument in different ways. You know, um, so for example, in Japan, when I did my research there, I noticed that there were three different ways in which um, Japanese panists viewed the instrument and perceived, had a certain perception of it. And you know, one of the ways in which some of them sort of um, understood the instrument was as a Trinidadian instrument. So mm -hmm. those steel bands in particular would play a lot of Trinidadian music, soca, calypso. Many times they had somebody who was Trinidadian either running the band or part of the band. Then you had steel bands who sort of interpreted it as a Japanese sort of um, instrument. Wow. Not, they're, not, they're not disregarding that it came yeah, from yeah. Japan but they're using it as an instrument to express their, their Japanese sensibilities, you know? So I thought that was really interesting because yeah, the, music, so the music that, that came from that were lots of um, original compositions, you know, that sort of um, fits this sort of uh, idea where they'll have audiences that appreciate that because they're probably used to hearing music in similar ways. That, that these Japanese compositions would be expressed on Can the I instrument. ask you something here? This is very interesting. Yeah, sure. Um, how do they play it? Do they play it standing up or sitting down? They, they play it standing up. Right. Because yeah. this, this is an observation by Ravi G here I thought was very interesting when he spoke about 
Indian people playing the pan, like playing Indian music on the pan and standing mm -hmm. up. And then he made a very interesting observation that, that the very, your gait, the, the body, the, the, the way you position your body and everything is, is part of an, an Afro, an African aesthetic, you know, and, 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 and a way of circulating energy and so forth. And that, for instance, in Indian classical music and much of Asian, which is why I asked about Japan, you know, it's sitting down cross-legged. So when you're playing vina, sitar, tabla, mm -hmm. or whatever, so you have that. And, and, and there's a, 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 it's, it's a, a different kind of thing. And, and he, was, he was saying, you know, um, if Indians were to play the pan sitting down, he wonders if a different type of music uh, would come out of it. It is a very interesting observation that I was wondering about um, in, in the Japanese well, context. Uh, if, and, if any of that was part of it no they don't sit and play because if you sit and play you're going to affect the sound of the instrument that's right because yeah. you know the pan is an idiophone which means the sound comes from the vibration of the body mm -hmm. so if you sit your legs are either touching the pan okay. or there's something that's going to be touching it when that's why play, it, it hangs from jump. a stand you have to move you have to <laughs> that yeah, too. yeah. <laughs> that too yeah. that too and mm. um well the third the third way in which japanese pan is sort of do the pan uh, third group, I should say, uh, is, is just purely as an instrument, you know, as in just like piano is an instrument that we may not know the history about, mm -hmm. you know, or a flute, um, yeah. you know, they just see it as another instrument that they could merge with other instruments, you know, Correct. whether it's traditional Japanese instruments, Western uh, music instruments, you know, so I've noticed that, that at least the the way in which Japan is viewed in Japan actually differs, you know, in just that that country yeah. alone. So far as for around the world, you know, yeah. and we see those sorts of similarities in those categories around the world because yeah. you see the you know you see the people in the US who are like yes, that's a Trinidadian instrument. My grandfather was Trinidadian, you know, or yeah. something like that, where they, they identify it with the people and culture of Trinidad. But then you have the others who are like, what is that? You know, yeah. that's, that's, you have the very Caribbean or even Hawaiian, you know, some people mistake the two. Yeah, exactly. You know, and, mm -hmm. and so, yeah, there, there's so many different uh, perspectives and reactions. And, yeah. and you know, one, one thing about the, the steel pan is just another instrument, which is very in interesting. Yeah, I mean, and it could be a novelty thing, like the way people might use maracas or, or the, um, yeah, yeah. what are the um i can't remember what it's called the, the yeah, two call it shak -shak. Fat sticks yeah shak -shak. no no not the shak -shak. the two oh. fat sticks like cuban usually the yeah yeah yeah. <laughs> but, uh, yeah so people might incorporate it as little flourishes here and there but then you have like the windham hill um jazz group or, or andy norell who would like incorporate it seriously in in let's say jazz and and you know what i've always thought you know, I, I've, I've wondered how, how they've thought of it. I, I don't know how, how the Windham Hill people think of it. Obviously, Andy, um, Andy Norell is so connected to the Trinidad um, experience as well, and very consciously. But, you know, I mean, in jazz, the xylophone and the, vib and the vibraphone is, is a big thing. And, and I, I, I thought that, you know, maybe, you know, there might be some kind of, you know, I, I don't know if people connected in their minds you know because you know vibes is a, is a huge thing in jazz it is i don't know uh, i'm interested in that in that thing have you ever explored that uh, you know like you mean the, pan and jazz yeah and like its relation to like you know i don't know the Z other percussion percussive but you know musical uh instruments like the xylophone like the vibraphone and stuff yeah, uh, have, have you ever spoken to people who maybe play both in a jazz band or something yeah, the, that's actually quite popular. You know, pan yeah. in jazz has been something that's developed. And there are a number of people who have sort of developed that idea. You know, Victor Provost is one. Yeah. Um, Liam Teague has yeah. also done that. And they, they're just two names, too few of, of the many people who sort of participate in the jazz world in particular. And um, you will see sometimes when they're playing in jazz bands that you would see the marimba, the xylophone, the yeah. vibraphone. Um, so it's very similar. And I think to education wise, at least on the tertiary level, when percussionists are studying percussion performance and they study mallet instruments like mm -hmm. the marimba and the vibraphone, now we are seeing more people being involved in pan as well. 
you know. Yeah. So that may not be specific to jazz in that case, but it's it's sort of when you're a percussionist, you need to know how to play all the percussive instruments, and steel pan falls within that category, and it's becoming more and more popular now. You know, especially now that um, steel bands are popping up in the more and more schools in the U.S. Especially as a percussionist, you're not doing yourself. Um, any favors if you don't, you know, learn how to play the steel pan because you just never know you might end up in a situation where you have to teach um, steel pan. So it's good for for those instrumentalists to involve the pan when they're doing their studies of vibraphone and marimba. It is a little different, but it's still sort of melodic percussive instruments. Yeah. You know, I mean, yeah. it, it it's amazing the unique layout of notes of the pan. I mean, it's really unlike any other instrument. Uh, you know, it's not linear. Uh, it's 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 quite it's quite amazing. It, it, it's really quite amazing, um, and 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 I I'm still curious as to why and how that developed. It, it's it's a totally different way of arranging notes, and, and then and yet it is you know very logical the circle of fourth. And I, I I don't know how conscious they were of that or not. It's incredible really to think about. Um, uh, okay, I I'm getting a, a request uh, to for you to play a little of the steel pan for the audience. May I, if, I, I don't know how how <laughs> to do that. May, maybe by the end we, we, we can, uh, if, sure. if, if it's going to take a lot of, uh, uh, of, of well, yeah, uh, I'm gonna have fidgeting. To... <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, so maybe at the end you could do it while Janine sure. is talking. You could be shifting in the back or something. <laughs> sure, but, sure, uh, closer to the end. So, sure. so be aware of that. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> okay. But... Uh, the next, the next thing I want to talk about is the expansion of the steel pan uh, globally and, and ways that might assist the economy of Trinidad and Tobago or the society. I know, Janine, you're, you, uh, you, I mean, you're not Trinidadian and, and this may or may not be something you can, you can talk about, but uh, if you do have any ideas about that, for instance, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking, if you have all these steel pan being taught in schools, how many do we need to produce a year? Where, where do we get them, for example, you know? And, and then what does that mean about things like the spread of, of, uh, of our culture uh, in, in, in the United States and, and people getting to know our culture and, you know, and, and, and then, you know, maybe you yourself, maybe the only reason you ever visited Trinidad is because of the steel pan, for, for example, I, I, I don't know. that. If, if you have any insights um, uh, on that, I'd like yeah. to hear them. I think there's a lot to say, but I'll just focus in on as an educator, I think that it would be really, I mean, of course, every year, well, outside of a pandemic, people come to Trinidad to play pan specifically, especially during carnival season. So, I mean, that does exist. Um, as an educator, that's fantastic. As an educator, I also think it would be great, for example, for my students to have the opportunity to go and visit, maybe not during that time because there's just so much happening and, you know, so that their focus to learn um, there would be nice, even if it was just like a week intensive or something, right? I think that would be very much mutually beneficial for, for that to occur, I would say. That'd be kind of my, my number one. Yeah. I mean, there are people who um, immigrated here and, um, tune pan and build pan and taught people here to do that. So there are a lot of people within the states that can provide that as, you know, necessary or what have you. But again, for me as an educator, I, I would, I would enjoy that for my yeah. students. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I worked for one of our greatest intellectuals, Lloyd Best, who's now passed. I, I, I worked very, very closely with him and um, while he was alive and, and, there was a program called Pan in Schools here, right? So putting Pan in the schools, which is <laughs> probably more successful in the United States than here in Trinidad, <laughs> but, uh, from what I'm hearing from you. Um, but then, but Lloyd had this thing of not Pan in schools, but school in Pan, right? Uh, about all the things you could learn about, even things like organization, uh, discipline, um, uh, community, uh, you know, um, uh, and then music theory and, and, and uh, economics, all sorts of things that you could learn in the pan setting. So it's interesting you're, you're talking about that, that if, if you really thought about 
all the things that that you could learn not just to play the pan which is important in and of itself but but there are a lot of other things that you could bring in um through that so that's very interesting mia i'm probably sure you have a lot to say about this and the way it could assist the economy uh, or the society in general the expansion of pan overseas i'd like to hear your insights yeah well first of all i want to say something you said that um you know talking about the success rate of pan in schools you know in trinidad versus mm -hmm. in the u.s i mean it's very hard to compare because the u.s is yeah. such a massive country right we don't nearly have as many schools you yeah. know that exist um in the United States, but we do have programs that are built into our school system. Um, the, we have the MMPU now, uh, which is a music program that sort of goes through a lot of schools across um, Trinidad and Tobago. And there are lots of schools that have steel bands in them. And then we see the success of that through Junior Panorama, you know, where we see so many schools competing in the primary school level, the secondary school level, and the non-schools. And the non-school category sort of um, consists of steel bands, of the senior steel bands, youth bands. So like there's Trinidad All Stars and then there's Trinidad All Stars Youth. You know, there's Renegades and there's Renegades Youth. The, the steel bands you mentioned, Invaders, there's Invaders Youth, Despers, there's, there's Despers Youth, you know, and stuff like that. So I would say within Trinidad, within our school system, yes, of course, anything, nothing's perfect. And yes, there could be stuff that could that can improve but so far you know we have a lot of people learning um, about the pan and that's also evident in the number of, of uh, pan majors that we have at UTT you know we uh, in our pan studio we have anywhere between 40 to 50 um, musicians who come to UTT to study pan you know specifically and they then go out and teach perform you know, they take up a lot of positions internationally. And now that we're talking about the expansion of PAN, you know, I, that's definitely something, of course, that will benefit Trinidad and Tobago because that's sort of, that's sort of our culture, you know, that we're, we're putting out there. And more and more steel bands are, are popping up all over the world, you know, and there are countries now that are able to connect with other panelists around the world. So things like the Virtual Steel Band Project, you know, the Pan and Unity Project, through the Virtual Steel Band Project, we didn't even realize how far Pan has got around the world. Yeah. So we ourselves here in Trinidad don't even understand how far it has gotten. Yeah. You know, so can you that, imagine? That, that, that's a real indicator of success when you just we totally lose control of it and it has a life of its own. That, that's yeah, good. I mean, that... that yeah. There's nothing bad can come from that, right? Because yeah. it's it's something that was developed here. And now more people recognize that it comes from here because yes, of course, there was an issue of people not knowing where the pan is from, they're thinking it's from Jamaica, you know. But now that we have we have technology, you know, we have YouTube and Facebook and people are connecting on TikTok and you know, with all these sorts of connections, it's much easier now for people to understand where the instrument came from, you know, and uh, so a lot of, I think there are a number of Trinidadians who feel threatened in a way by this expansion, but it's really something to embrace because it's, it's, it's very similar. It's very similar to the whole controversy about Juve and Michael Jordan using <laughs> the word and, and now it's gone. Right. From the rum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for the, in the pan world, I mean, it's, it's once you have more steel bands, that means you need more teachers. Yeah. If teachers and directors, how do you right. become a teacher or director? You come to Trinidad and you study, you know, so, right. so that's, that's more students there. You mm -hmm. have more steel bands, that means you need more tuners, you need more builders, you know, and uh, we have a number of builders and tuners here in Trinidad. We have a number of builders and tuners in the United States. And uh, with the expansion, even the, all of the pan tuners and builders probably aren't even enough. Yeah. You know, so so I think that the expansion certainly um, is something that's fantastic. I see I'm already sort of part of different committees that are talking about expansion in other places, you know, and then through the through the virtual steel band and through the pan and unity, we get to make connections with people in other countries where they want to expand themselves. You know, we met a guy in Spain. He said, I'm the only person here playing pan and I want to start a steel band, you know, so so I see 
in this sort of technologically advanced world that we're living in and now through the pandemic everybody has sort of realized how easy it is to connect um, and have meetings and 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 create projects i feel as though post pandemic i think we're going to be looking at a massive expansion of the pan to be honest you know that's what that's what i see and i see that just through the conversations that i've i've had with people in, in different parts of the world you know, just conversations I've had with people who want to start up steel bands where they are, you know, so I, I think just knowing some of the projects that are coming out of Trinidad, I, I, I see it as a really positive thing. And I'm, I'm very hopeful that we're going to be expanding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, again, working with, with Lloyd Best, he had a lot of very creative ideas. I remember he, he had this idea that he was saying, listen, you know, the way, you know, football or, or soccer, as Americans call it, um, uh, it is popular around the world or, or, or e even cricket. Now you have CPL, you know, well, the CPL, the IPL in India, CPL here. Um, right, so how, I mean, but sports is, is one of the biggest franchises and industries in the world. But who would have thought, you know, some fellas kicking a ball wherever in England and, and, uh, and then it, it got turned into this massive economic enterprise. And he was thinking, you know, why can't, you know, the panorama model of various steel bands and having competition. And so you have like, you know, uh, so just like how we have panorama in Trinidad, but, but why can't these sort of tournaments and competition, musical term, tournaments, musical compositions, you know, eventually come up to something like the way the global sporting industry is. Who, who would have thought that, I mean, if, if you were in the 19th century looking at, you know, people playing cricket in uh, wherever they played it in England, um, that it would turn into this massive thing in Sri Lanka and South Africa and India and the Caribbean and, and elsewhere, you know? I mean, uh, it, it, it's, it's interesting that, you know, maybe these, these sorts of, of things might happen. But yeah, th those are insights you have are, are very uh, interesting. Both, I mean, there's, there's the physical part of building the pan itself. You know, and, and in fact, uh, I mean, that, that's one of our, our, our policies in, in, in expanding, uh, in looking to expand that here. But, but then there's all those other things, the training and, and whatnot, and um, very oh. interesting. Uh, so I, I know you, you've, you've told some of, some of your stories, but, but uh, I, I will ask you again, if, if you have any special stories, uh, just about, you know, uh, any interesting stories you might have about how the steel pan has been used or adopted in other countries? Could be the U.S., where you're from, Janine, or elsewhere, or Mia, in your travels. You know, what, what are some of the most interesting stories um, surrounding the pan that you've seen? Uh, I'll ask Janine first and then back to Mia. Um, so, I mean, I would say that there's nothing too wild that I've necessarily seen. You know, there's a lot of uh, groups here that focus on... Um, Trinidadian music and or our own localized music but put to pan which I feel like is in a sense kind of a Trinidadian thing because that's what you know mm -hmm. playing soca and calypso and that type of thing on pan. Um, I think for me personally in my experiences here one of the more interesting things has been actually um, the existence of adult community steel band here. I mean we definitely associated with schools. We definitely associated it with um, like communities that have come here from various places in the West Indies. Um, we associate it with youth outreach quite a bit, right? Like I think okay. all these things are pretty common, um, but I don't think we always think about community music making for adults, like yeah. kind of retiree aged adults. Yeah. Um, and that's one thing that I would, I'm grateful that I got to participate in uh, doing something like that here as a director. Um, I mean, there are, I think since the seventies in the US, there's been this tradition of what are called new horizons bands. So these band community activities for adults, professionals, retirees, um, be it because they never learned an instrument or they're like returning to that activity. And I just think it's so great, like the idea of community music making where you're not necessarily, I mean, it's important to focus on, of course, the specifics and the scales and right technique and all those things. But I think it's really great to have that side too, where you get to, it's just about 
I don't know, the non-musical aspects, kind of what you're mentioning before about yeah. community and how to relate to each other and those sorts of things. And again, because the pan is relatively accessible physically, even if you've not played an instrument when you were a child, you still might be able to pick this up as an adult. Maybe you're going to read music. Maybe that's not what you're going to do. Um, but I think that's it's like a it's like a sector of society that we don't always think of our our aging population and what they can get out of something like that. That's very interesting because you know um, I never would have even thought of that like that that it's it's unusual for adults to play. You know I'm thinking because. It's, it's big men that, that, that play it here mainly, you know, but adults uh, play it here. And so, yeah, that, that it is kind of thought as a, as a, 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 a student type of thing uh, up there. And, and then, you know, when you're talking about that too, the community aspect, I guess, yeah, in, you know, with your noise pollution laws and, and so forth in, in those countries, having a pan yard would probably be totally out of the question. And for, for the international audience, I'm sure uh, Mia would be able to expand in a more. But, you know, so we, we have these open spaces where the, where the pans are kept in a pan yard and, and uh, people from the community, they walk in and, and other people just sit and, and they might watch the, the panists practicing for panorama and so forth. And it's a, it's a, it, it's, it's a, you know, it's a space where you go and, and, and you could hear the panists practicing from, from all the houses and all the, uh, the areas around. And I mean, in, in, uh, you know, in, in certain European and, and, uh, American cities uh, that would just not be permissible, but that's that's part of life here. You know, um, you, you you have that uh, sort of musical thing, and everybody, whether you want to or not, you're going to be hearing pan music at that time. You know, um, yeah. So that that's very interesting, and 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 these are the the cultural differences. Yeah, I I you know I didn't think about about those things, and, and it is fascinating. But how about you, Mia? I'm sure you're full of stories um, <laughs> uh, from all your travels and whatnot. Well, I mean, yeah, I mean, what you what you were just talking about where, yes, we do have, you know, um, steel bands practicing in neighborhoods. You know, I actually did not realize how unique that was until I went away. That's right. You know? And, uh, you know, I also grew up close to a steel band, um, just, a few buildings away from my house that I grew up in, uh, there's 50 dimension panyard. So sometimes I would be in all sass panyard practicing for panorama. When I came home and I was sleeping, I was here in 50 dimension. You know, so I mean, it's 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 such a normal thing for us, but it's not very normal. Yeah. Uh, you know, in a lot of other countries, especially in Japan. You right. know, in Japan, noise pollution is you know they they're very strict about noise especially in the residential areas like i remember i was living in a very tiny apartment in yokohama and uh, i couldn't even i couldn't practice you know and uh, you know because i couldn't practice some some panels would have to go either in the park and practice they'd have to rent a karaoke um one of those little karaoke rooms that they can practice in and steel bands would actually have to rent spaces in order to practice and those yeah. would have those times would have to be very specific, whether it's community centers or mm -hmm. places that you rent to rehearse, you know, so it was not uh, where you can just go in some open space and, and get a panyard, you know, panyards don't really exist in Japan. Yeah. Um, you're still banned, you have to play and you, you're practicing in different locations every time you go to practice. Actually, you know? he, he, here's a question I have. Do mm -hmm. panyards exist in other Caribbean islands? I've, I've never seen one in Jamaica, for example. I lived in Jamaica for a while. I've never seen one. I've never looked for one in the other <laughs> island where I visited. But, but do well, they, they, is, is that just a Trinidad phenomenon? No, it's not. Okay. I mean, the, the islands that have a lot of steel bands on them or, or islands that have Panorama, for example, like Antigua, they mm. have pan, pan yards, you know. Okay. So, so I would say it's, it's even though, yes, it may have been something developed in Trinidad, but it's, yeah. it's, it's very much easily a Caribbean concept. That's right. You know, of, of having that space. And because remember, Steel Bantu is a community That's concept. Right. It's an idea of community. So even within the panyards, yes, there are the musicians playing there, but the people who are in their houses around feel as though they're also part you exactly. know, of, of I, the band. I, I would think it would be similar in, let's say, a place like India as well, where it's noisy and boisterous and people are doing like something like that would be kind of normal there of course all in the caribbean islands probably in latin american countries you know where 
where you know uh, people aren't so uptight because <laughs> yeah. that that's that's right. part of it that's part of it yes it's, yeah. it's part of it it's part of the trinidadian yeah. culture. probably even mediterranean countries it might be something like that Maybe. you know you have these big catholic festivals that that take up the whole you know village or whatever uh, and, and so. everybody has to participate it's, it's it's that kind of gregarious kind of culture as opposed to uh you know um yeah yeah mm -hmm. So, yeah so right. yeah okay well very, very interesting uh, but but i mean that that was your comment on 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 the steel uh the pan yard and so forth but anything else you want to talk about that you've come across because you've be, you've been to so many places well i think i think another unique thing is you know steel pan has sort of been a very historically male dominated um music mm -hmm. and culture um, and but now, of course, we see more women involved. We see women in leadership roles, you know. But when you go to some other countries, you realize, oh, there are more women than than men. Like very yes. distinctly, it's like something you'd notice very easily. And you know, as an ethnomusicologist, you know, it's always important to look at the culture of of sort of why that is, right? Because for us here in Trinidad, historically, the pan has sort of come from this place where parents didn't want their girl children to be a part of. Exactly. Right. So so culturally, it was very male dominated just because of where it came from and the people who were involved, you know, so so coming through history of Pan in Trinidad, we see that that's why it has sort of become a male dominated thing. But that is not the history in other countries. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, so depending on the country, there's a different history of the Pan and its development. And in a country like Japan, Pan mostly is a hobby and women have hobbies in Japan, right? Mm. Men are sort of expected to work longer hours, whereas right. women, they participate in hobbies and they have jobs, but they might end earlier than the men, you know, and, and as a result, they have more time to participate in hobbies, you know, but you would see a lot of male um, directors and there are female directors too, but that's why there's so many women that play Pan because culturally, they're the ones that have the time to do so, you know, unless they, you know, if they get married and have a child, and most times they end up leaving the steel band, because then, of course, their time is spent doing that. Um, but, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that was quite unique, you know, to see um, coming from, um, you know, steel bands here, where it's, you know, me growing up, at least the time when I was growing up, it was definitely more men than women. I mean, it's a different yeah. story now, but that was something that that really stood out to me. Yeah, um, yeah, that that's yeah. a very interesting observation. Because I mean, so just like the the age uh, observation that Janine made, then the gender observation. Yeah, that's very important. Yeah. And and also there's there's a kind of class thing as well too, in in a sense. And, yes. and because I mean, I um, my father is always telling me story. I mean, he he loves pan, he plays pan. But when he was small, his mother didn't allow him to, and and all. And you hear the story of I, I mean, it's hard to think of the steel pan as an instrument or, or, or associated with gangs and gang warfare. But that's what it was. And to and to show that you were a badge on, you know, a, a, a tough guy, a, a kind of gangster ish. If you had two steel band sticks sticking out of your back pocket, th this is the law. I, I didn't live during that time, but what I hear from my father and what you hear all the time, everybody speak about. But that was a sign that you were a real dangerous bad man. If you had two, two pan sticks sticking out of your back pocket. That, that's, I, I, it's incredible. I, it's just hard for me to, to wrap my head really around, you know. But uh, yeah, so, so it, it's, it's interesting. Um, yeah, and so it was macho. So Pan is associated with that macho culture, that, um, you know, um, fighting. And, and I think this is a kind of culture thing. I've always thought about this as, with dance as well, right? Like in, yeah. in many cultures, dance is seen as feminine in modern days. But certainly, let's say in Afri African culture, Afro-American culture, dance, I mean, and, and, and let's say even things like, let's say Punjabi culture, right? When men are dancing, in these cultures, it is not feminine in the least, right? I mean, and, and, and you are showing off your virility, in fact, in, with, with those dances and, and your prowess and, and so forth. You know, but but it, it's, you know, it, it's different. So, so Pan, uh, you know, was part of this, this masculine, macho, violent culture uh, when it started. And, and it's, it's very interesting 
that you know that that's very hard uh probably to to convey and um and whether you want to or not is, is another issue but that is a uh, that's it that's a very interesting observation um a, a couple of, of things maybe i'd like to ask uh, ask you is uh, in terms of the expansion of pan right there, there, there's a concern by trinidadians always um you know that oh they don't know where the pan is coming from and one, one of the things is the rivalries with jamaica right because everybody thinks of Jamaica is the Caribbean. So everything comes from Jamaica. Oh, uh, Trinidad, what part of Jamaica is that from? And Trinidadians really resent that, right? really, really resent that. Um, so, so there's obviously that sensitivity. But, um, but, you know, but sometimes, you know, I, I've heard people tell me, you know, you know, nobody, knew, and, and Mia did mention it before, and, and we did have a little conversation that, uh, you know, nobody really knows about the history of the piano or the guitar or or the drum uh, kit or, or whatever so you know why really is it is it so important isn't that some sort of cultural insecurity or, or, or whatever you know it's nice for people to know about it but you know is, is that so central and a lot of and, and we saw it play out in, in this controversy with juve right um which which uh, the the use of the term juve which is associated with carnival here uh, and, and the American film star Michael Jordan from Black Panther movie and other things, of course, um, he wanted to use that term to promote a rum. But many people here were very upset that he's using our term and they're stealing our, our things and his cultural appropriation and, and, and these sort of uh, arguments. Um, and, and down here, there, there, there are different points of view. They're saying, look, we could have had a... a, a uh, a door to the world with this what, what, what sort of uh, you know foolish insecurity is that so that's one side you know and uh, so there are some of these um, I suppose dangers or, or issues there's also things about genuine legitimate stealing Mia, Mia was telling me about this in a conversation earlier about like a, a company coming down to Trinidad and and stealing intellectual property and, and profiting uh, from it as well. So I, this happens in every industry, I guess, not only in this. But um, I don't know if you have any stories or insights in, into those types of things. Maybe some of the, the issues, problems, challenges, or, um, uh, or other th uh, things to think about in terms of um, pan expanding throughout the world. Uh, Janine, Mia, I'll invite Janine first. Um, I think that that's a really complicated and multifaceted topic in question, really just the idea of what precisely is cultural appropriation and how to define it um, and what is culture and who owns it and those types of things. I mean, it's really broad and, you know, you could talk for hours on that. Um, I think relating that to my observations and experiences in the States, um, where it kind of, I think where it perhaps rubs me the wrong way or concerns me or leaves a bad taste in my mouth is when people, be it the way that a school functions or a particular person here that's there that's the director or maybe it's just an individual who feels like an ownership perhaps that's not really mm -hmm. theirs to yeah. have. I mean, these are all individualized cases and, you know, it's, whatever. And I mean, of course, any student who's like a kid or whatever, who's learning something, I mean, of course, they're putting in the work, they're learning how to do this thing, you know, they have some type of ownership over what it is that they're doing. But I do think that there are different programs and people that I've come in contact with who there's just this vibe, yeah. for could, lack of a better could you term. expand on it? Well, yeah, expand it. Like, what do you mean by this ownership or, or the vibe? Um, no naming it's names. Like a, it's like a <laughs> it's like a lack of awareness for I don't know if it's intentional or not or both uh, awareness or education or reverence for other things that exist in the pan world outside of them. Yeah, I mean, yeah, like yeah. everything comes from somewhere, and I mean yeah. maybe the reason that. Um, it seems like such a sensitive issue for Trinidadians at the moment. I mean, the instrument's very young. I Perhaps during the piano days that it was being invented, people were like, that's ours. I don't know, like they may have been <laughs> like that. You know what I mean? I think yeah, there's a lot yeah. of things to consider in like constructing that and 
power relationships in the world at that time and this time and equity and all those things. So, so yeah, but I mean, there are just some, I don't know, some programs and people that I've come across that I don't, it, it's hard to articulate exactly, but mm -hmm. it doesn't make me feel comfortable. Like they are isolated in their way of thinking and, and they're kind of okay with, with that. Right, 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 right. Now, let, let me ask you just, just in your experience with, with that to ask you to expand. So um, I take it you've, you've, I mean, well, you've obviously have been to Trinidad several times and, and so forth. Um, so, and, and I take it that was purely because of the pan and, and so forth. So, so you kind of invested your time and, and, you know, I guess it was a passion of yours to, to come down here and, and learn more about it. Could, could you just describe that? A little bit more um like how it happened and, and what you did here and maybe what you know what your experiences was when you came here for the first time to see it in its context as opposed to in school in sure. ohio <laughs> i mean it's so different um that was in 2004 and i mean i like travel and culture and all those things anyway and it just seemed like a natural thing to do is to go to the place where an instrument that i play all the time is from and you know I don't know. I mean, it, it it reminds me of what you guys are talking about with you. It's just existing in the ether all the time. It's very yeah. hard to explain. I mean, it's not that hard, but just like, wow, this is this is everywhere. This is it's really real, like yeah. <laughs> casual community, you know, in any given circumstance. And it's hard to explain that to my students now. Like just the idea of going outside in that kind of regularly, not like every day at every moment of the day, of course, but just you know, that is part of the environment. Um, I mean, it was a great experience. I don't know. There was a lot. It was just a lot. But yeah. in a good way. <laughs> very good. Very good. You know, I, I think it's, it's it, that sounds a little bit like me when I went to England for the first time. And, you know, the English language you speak, you know, but you're driving on the highway and it's like you're passing by Nottinghamshire. And like, wait, that's Robin Hood. <laughs> and then it's, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, Shakespeare stuff. And like, oh, okay wow okay this is where all this stuff <laughs> comes from <laughs> it's, it's, it's very different yeah so I, I think it's the same sort of thing all right and uh, and and uh, Mia yeah I, I referenced you a lot just now in terms of the, the things about the appropriation about the you know the legal issues and in, in actual intellectual property theft and these sorts of things you want to expand a bit on it yeah well I think um Trinidadians, or I should say Trinbagonians, because it's Trinidad and Tobago, and Tobago is very part of our, very much part of our um, steel pan culture mm -hmm. and history. Um, Trinbagonians are very proud people, right? We, we love the things that we have, you know, we've developed unique food. We have food that's unique to Trinidad and Tobago. We have music that's unique to Trinidad and Tobago. We have our instrument that's unique to Trinidad and Tobago. So, especially when we travel, you couldn't find a Trinidadian that was more proud, right? <laughs> so because because we, we appreciate our culture, especially when we're outside, right? That's really where it sort of shows up. Maybe not so much in Trinidad, mm. but when you, when you leave, it's, it's, it's the pride that you feel when you see other Trinidadians, especially in, in places where you wouldn't necessarily think you're gonna see you know, somebody from your country. But because I think because of that, also because of our history, you know, our colonial history, where culture and and different artifacts that that have sort of been stolen historically you know when you have invented an instrument and a and a, a family of instruments that's so fresh and new that comes from trinidad and tobago anybody else they need to acknowledge that here's where it's from yeah. because because and i also a, think it, i think it's also part of it too that a lot of people don't even know Trinidad in the first place. And they think, oh, it's part of Jamaica or something. And it's like, right. no, no, not at all. Yeah, so it, it's even just, you know, we exist. And not only do we exist, exactly. look, look at what we've done, you know, yeah. Exactly, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's what we've contributed to the world, yeah. you know. Mm -hmm. So for, you, for some, anybody to sort of try and take that away from us, of course we're going to get upset. You know, of course we're going to be offended because... If you really look at the history of Pan, you know, people died over this instrument. Yeah. You know, and where did they die? Where did this come from? This came from right here in Trinidad and Tobago or dot on the map. 
And, and as Janine mentioned, you know, yes, yes, the piano is the piano and the guitar is the guitar. And who knows, maybe historically they had the similar stories, but the, the steel pan as an instrument is quite new compared to a lot of other instruments. So you've, you know, when I, when I say you, I mean like the colonial history has already taken away so much from us, us historically that now that we have an opportunity to, to show something to the world that is ours, Oh, bet your bottom dollar. We not letting you take yeah, that from yeah, us. Yeah. You know, so so I I feel um that's why, you know, I think Trinidadians or me, let me talk for myself in this scenario. Me in particular, you know, I I once I travel, it's like this instrument is from Trans Tobago. Or you think it's from Jamaica. I am going to let you know that it's not. <laughs> you know, it is Jamaica and Trinidad and Tobago, two different countries. Yes, we both function in the in the Caribbean, but you know, it's it's sort of this um it's it's a moment to teach your audience and it's a moment to educate them not that they just don't know better you know so we yeah. can't get upset at them they just don't know and it's it's sort of up to us to, to make sure that 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 right uh, history is there because i'm sure if you go and you google where's the piano from i'm sure you can find lots of information about that so we also need to make sure that the information is out there and it's getting out there you know okay. so I some yeah, yeah. We're, we are we're at the end of the program but but i i do want to I do want you to expand just slightly, right? Because mm -hmm. we only have a little bit of time, but, sure. but just on some of the legal issues, like, uh, or, 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 you know, like in terms of the production, we, we were talking about this company um, mm -hmm. in, in the United States and, and uh, yeah, could you just give us an example yeah. so people can understand? Yeah, there's, okay, so there's a company in the US that sort of came to Trinidad, learned how to make pans, transcribe you know change uh, musical arrangements and musical compositions to score to music score went back to the us created a company and sold all of it and none of the benefits came back to trinidad and they the composers and the artists you know so i mean when you have things like that happen especially to, to our own people of course we're going to want to stand up and and be very vocal you know about um, how our instruments is handled, the kind of information that's out there, making sure that the right people get accredited for the work that they've done. You know, because this is something that has been happening for so long. You know, where people come into a country, take it, and make it their own, and just you know be, become you know a big seller internationally without any sort of credit of where it came from. So there is that idea of stealing, and that's yeah. what it is: stealing. You, yeah. you stole it. It's not your intellectual property. You because know? they're profiting so, from it. They're, they're, they're profiting actually making from it, money. Making yeah, money. Yeah. And, uh, and nothing's wrong with, with um, you know, that sort of borrowing. But you have hmm. to give credit where credit is due. If you're making money, then the person who created it needs to make money too. You know, so you can't you can't just take it and just do what you want with it, and and that and that is something that is very much frowned down upon, upon. And I'm hoping that's the case all over. That we should be looking down at these things and 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 holding people accountable for these types of actions. Right. Okay. Um. Just uh, I, I'll I'll ask you guys to to close up with some thoughts, but also. If you can, you don't have to, uh, Janine, but M Mia, I think, should. Uh, any ideas on what um, the government should be doing to help uh, the expansion of the pan? You, you might have some ideas, Janine, and, and you're, you're free, but don't feel pressured to, to think about a policy thing. Uh, so let me ask you to have a closing statement, Janine, and then Mia. The government in Trinidad? Yeah, yeah. That, no, uh, I it could be elsewhere. Not I cannot comment on that, but what I will say to piggyback off what Mia said is it would be sensible that we in this country would be better about our, you know, copyright issues and internationally specifically um, and intellectual property because it is a problem here with a lot of countries outside of here of us taking their music essentially and crediting ourselves. Yeah, yeah, right. Good, good. And, um, and and by the way, but well, let me ask you something. In terms of the expansion of the pan in schools up there, has that all been voluntary, or or has has government been involved in that? Like, has our do you, are you aware whether our government has been involved in that or not? I'm unfamiliar with any right. government really being involved yeah. with it. But I I, I think that is something we should look into as a as a government because if it's happening. I'm sure we could support it, but that because that's a very interesting 
um, you know, uh, phenomenon that I probably don't even fully understand, that I'm sure I don't fully understand yet, but, but which, which I uh, learned from you here. Yeah, Mia, uh, your closing thoughts, yeah. recommendations, etc. Well, I, you know, I think it's all about support because it's not to say we have to create anything new. We have the pan builders, we have the pan tuners, we have the educators, we have the performers, we have the steel bands, you know, the talent is there and we, we have what it takes to sort of create even more expansion because there has been expansion happening. We're talking about even more expansion and sort of benefits for Trinidad. We have what is needed, but what we need now is the support to get it done. You know, so so sometimes that support could come in in the in in a money format. The support can come sort of with backing us. You know, as and I mean us, I mean the music industry, the steel mm -hmm. panists, um, the creative artists. You know, backing us in a sort of way that will help us get out there internationally. You know, and sort of and make a name for for ourselves. You know, as a country, even bigger than than we actually are. So to me, it comes down to support. You know, it's not that the government has to create anything new, right? I mean, right. everybody's mm -hmm. there. It's yeah. just now to, to, to get us all on the same page. And, and that's another thing too. Sometimes there's like competition, you know, this band yeah. and this band and, you know, this person's doing this and this person's doing this over here and you don't want to tell, you know. But now I feel like we're in a place where everybody's collaborating and wanting to do things together. And we care less about the competition among each other and more so about uplifting each other and, and our country. And, and what we need is are those extra building blocks that help us to step up so that we can then truly um, expand, which will then only bring positive things to Trinidad and Tobago. Absolutely. So um, that's, that's my opinion. Right. Well, thanks a lot. I appreciate that. And before you go, you want to just, yeah, can you hit a few notes on the uh, oh, yeah. back there? Oh, sure. So are you seeing? This is, yes, we're seeing. This it. is a tenor pan, and as you said, it's organized in, in fourths and fifths. So if I go um, anti-clockwise, I'm in fifths. <laughs> And if I go clockwise, it's actually fourths. And I can play, I mean, it's, it's fully chromatic. So I can play anything. <laughs> you know, anything can be played on the, on the steel pan. I think some people might have the idea that it's only so called calypso, but you can yeah. literally play any piece any genre, any style. And this is a tenor pan, which is just one mm -hmm. of many um, pans within a steel orchestra. Can, can, can you play like a, a little five second unusual thing on it? Um, or, unusual? Well, I mean, oh, usual, doesn't matter, whatever you want, a favorite piece. Maybe I can do something that everybody might know globally, yeah. you know, something mm -hmm. very simple, like uh, maybe Twinkle Twinkle. <laughs> All right, thank you very much. No okay, great, great. Well, thanks so much for this fascinating and, and very interesting discussion. It's really been a pleasure having both of you on the program. Thank you for having me and, and Jeannie. Thank thanks for having us. <laughs> great. Well, that's it for this week's episode of A Story Club, Global Politics and Cultures, brought to you by Bulletproof Podcast Formula. We were talking with our guests, Janine Tiffy from the United States and Mia Gormandy Benjamin from Trinidad and Tobago on Trinidad Steel Pan in the global culture industry, navigating possibilities and conflicts. I'd also like to thank you, our audience, for watching and listening. Please join us again next week. And in the meanwhile, like, share, follow, subscribe, and tell your friends about us. If you're watching on YouTube, please click on the bell icon as well so you get notifications of when our programs are uploaded. Thanks again and see you next week.